Hi everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm Katie Young and I'm the Club Development Manager um, at De Montford University, um, but I'm also the Club Development Rep for the Students Rugby Union and I am hosting today for you. Um, first off, just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, there's an awful lot of information to get through today and the main focus is going to be how we rebuild and maintain interest, uh, especially in term two, as we've all survived term one and we see what uh, the future will bring us uh, across our universities. So we're hoping today we'll give you ideas and information that you can take back to your universities and your clubs, but also um, engage you in what we're doing as an organisation going forward. So across universities um, and across the sports sector, we're seeing a huge range of approaches to activity and to getting back into sport and physical activity. I really want to emphasise that we're all ultimately working towards the same goal, which is a safe return, a safe return to rugby um, and a safe return to university sport. Whether that's us at the SRFU, um, you guys back in your own institutions or colleagues at Bucks, or, or the RFU. Um, but unfortunately, none of us have got a crystal ball or all the answers. Um, so this is about how we all help each other to achieve that ultimate aim. So my role at the SRFU is looking at um, the development of our clubs and how we support you. Um, especially those of you that aren't already part of a cluster um, or a partnership and looking at how we help you recruit, retain and transition your players and keep people engaged in, in rugby. What I'm going to do now is just give you a quick update about what we've been doing as the SRFU um, and hopefully give you some ideas about how you can get involved um, going forward. So as we mentioned in the last webinar, the governance review is still ongoing um, and We've got a huge focus on how we increase member engagement. So this is one of those ways with our webinars, which again, brilliant to see so many of you here today. The other thing that we've done is um, our grant process. And this year we saw the most applications we've had um, for quite some time. So over 30 applications with every eligible application receiving a contribution. So really pleased with how, that, how that's gone as well as how we've managed to do that while safeguarding um, the longer term financial stability for the SRFU. Um, so talking about grants, um, we're looking at what we're going to do next and what the next round of grant funding might be for. So we should have a poll coming up um, where I would like you to tell me what you think um, the next priority round of funding should be for. So as your club, as your university, where would the most benefit be for support from us to you? Um, is it around how to fundraise in your own communities, whether that's students um, across your student body or the wider community? Is it around how we help you access coaching and officiating courses? Would you like support around um, developing your player welfare? So are you doing mental health courses and um, interventions? Is there anything around inclusion or club management? So uh, obviously health and safety, risk assessments, things like that are at the forefront of everybody's minds at the moment. Can we support you um, in accessing development around that? or marketing and communication. We've all moved to an online world, a digital way of working. Do you need uh, support resources in order to do that better? So hopefully we've got votes coming in. I can't actually see those on my, <laughs> on my screen, but Elisa will, I think, close the poll once people have um, put some answers in. Okay, so we've got quite an even split there. So coaching and officiating up there, right up there with player welfare and mental health and inclusion. So that's really interesting, thank you. Uh, what we'll do is take that feedback into our 
um, considerations for what we do for the next underground. Um, so that actually ties in really nicely with the uh, question around what else we can do to support you to develop your clubs and your players um, and your committees in terms of off the pitch engagement. So welfare and inclusion is absolute absolutely fundamental to making sure that we're a welcoming sport and that we can recruit and retain our players as we go through. We want to have greater representation from you, our members, in what we're doing going forward. Um, and as part of that, I have another poll to see whether there is any interest in engaging in some working groups. So, and you'll see when they come up as an option, one of the working groups we've got is diversity and inclusion, which may be of interest to some of you. So where we are looking at things like our grant process, our awards, um, how we engage with you as uh, members, these are suggestions for how we might structure that going forward. So marketing and communications, how do we better use um, our online presence? Diversity and inclusion, what kind of training and development should we be doing with student clubs? Transitions and alumni, how can we better support you um, to help players progress um, and stay in the sport? And lastly, the events. We were going to have a brilliant student conference, um, but unfortunately, COVID got in the way of that. So thinking about going forwards, what might you be involved in? Um, and again, Elisa will show us where the interest is. Okay, so transitions and alumni, again, a fairly even split, diversity and inclusion, great, really pleased to see that's getting such a high, high presence. That's really helpful. And um, there will be further information coming out about this. Keep your eyes peeled. Um, but that is a very brief overview of what the SRFU have been working on and selfishly what I specifically in my role and focused on over the coming year. So without further ado, I am passing over to Jenny from Bucks to give us a bit of an overview about the competition side of things. Thanks, Jenny. Lovely, thank you very much, Katie. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna to attempt to uh, share my screen with you because I've got a little bit of a presentation so you don't just have to focus on my voice there's something um, visual for you all to see. Um, I'm hoping that's up on screen now so if it's not can someone please shout and I'll kind of uh, press on unless I'm told otherwise. Um, I just wanted, I've got about five minutes, just wanted to share some key updates with you particularly focusing on our term two planning because I know there's a lot of questions around that at the moment so I'm going to pick out some key points and then I know at the end when we do uh, the Q&A panel there'll be opportunity for you to kind of ask some further questions around any of these bits or anything else. Um, that you're curious about at the moment from a box perspective. So first of all, I'm just going to um, confirm some decisions that have been taken around reward and recognition for this season. So hopefully you're all aware um, that the decision has been made to not award any box points for the 2021 season, given the extraordinary nature of this coming season in the sense of you know, we still don't know how much competition is going to take place. We had a handful of in-person events during term one. We were very lucky to be able to deliver some golf and tennis competition. Um, but just because we don't know what's going to, to happen for the rest of this season, we've taken this decision because we don't feel there's an opportunity to create that national um, ranking that we normally do associated to box points because it wouldn't be a fair reflection uh, of the competition. Um, that recommendation came from our sport review implementation group and carried 95% support from universities. Um, so hence the decision to move forward with that. We are still looking though to crown national champions when it comes to our league programmes and within our event delivery. So there will still be uh, medalists across our individual events. And that is because we're going to offer a knockout competition at the championship level. So at the very top tier uh, of our league structures. Now, with regards to term two planning, the deadline for entries uh, into term two was Friday the 16th of October. We then published provisional leagues on Friday the 30th of October. And then there was a, a two week period within which universities could review those provisional leagues that we published based on entries uh, and withdraw 
uh, from the, the league programme, free of charge, so um, not being charged team entry fees up until Friday just gone. Um, we were originally due to then publish the finalised leagues and associated fixtures on Friday the 27th of November, but in a slight change of plan based on obviously the recent um, lockdown within England and changing guidelines across all the home nations, what we're actually going to do is by tomorrow uh, produce a, a further update to provisional leagues, so not considering them the, the finalised leagues just yet. So they will be published based on the feedback during that free withdrawal period. And then the actual fixture release itself is still TBC at the moment. Um, the reason for that is because of all the feedback we've had from members in, in various forums over the last few weeks around universities still considering withdrawing from the leagues and, and still waiting on a number of factors to make those final decisions. So we don't want to produce finalised fixtures kind of in the knowledge that that isn't going to be reflective of probably what the competition is going to look like if it goes ahead in term two. So we're holding off um, fixture release dates at the moment. Um, but what we have committed to is that by next Friday, the 27th, we will give an update on that um, intended release date. And then the season start date itself uh, was originally due to be um, uh, late January. And that is actually under review itself as well uh, in the context of what I've just talked about there around fixture release date and confirmation of leagues. I'm just gonna, for a second, touch on, I guess, what the four scenarios that are at play for the league start date in term two. So the original intended start date was the 27th of January, and that's what, the original timelines around publishing leagues and releasing fixtures was based on. And that is uh, the model as we've published already, including that knockout at championship level. And within that, there are a number of um, uh, break weeks within that. So within the, the program running from January to March, there was the opportunity with the way that we structured the competition for at least four to six uh, break weeks within there to account for things like weather and such to allow as many fixtures to take place as possible. But what we're hearing more and more, uh, I guess what we're realising as well, that the league start date may be pushed back. And so what I want to demonstrate here with these additional scenarios is just to give you a flavour of if it is pushed back, what the kind of repercussions or consequences of that could be, but also in the vein of competition can still take place. So hopefully it's a, a positive message. Effectively, we could push it back another three weeks. So any date between the kind of 3rd and 17th of uh, February and not see too much impact on the structure itself. And there would still be the opportunity uh, to offer those break weeks and there would still be the option for us to deliver a knockout competition. The latest start date um, to allow us to facilitate all fixtures as we plan to include in terms of the number of teams within the leagues and how many fixtures that would equate to from a league perspective, not including the knockout. We believe that we could still go with, with a late, you know, end of February start date and still be able to facilitate um, a full league programme, but it would be league only. So that would mean losing uh, the knockout stage at the championship level. But as I said, that's only being offered um, at Prem and National League level this season. There is also still an option where if we get into March in terms of start date, um, that we could still run a condensed league programme for Bucks, but it would be a new model. It wouldn't be reflective of the league structure that we've got published at the moment. So it would be a case of us kind of revisiting that, uh, repopulating leagues and republishing so that is kind of worst case scenario but it's just to give you a flavor of there are still a number of scenarios and options in play and that if we're not able to start on the 27th of January it doesn't mean that the league program won't go ahead and then I guess just to, to finish on you know what are the key takeaways what are the key messages from Bucks at the moment well we are still planning for term two activity it's not off the table at the moment um, the recent RFU communication around their decision uh, to uh, suspend their league competition programme, um, they made it clear that does not include box competition, although we are not exempt from the, the return to play guidelines, which I think we'll probably touch on in a little bit more detail in the Q&A. Um, but what that means is, you know, the phase of return to play in each of the home nations, whether contact is allowed or such, will still you know, 
uh, be of relevance. It's just around the fact that box competition has not been taken off the table. I just want to kind of make that clear to everyone. And as I've just demonstrated on the previous slide, there are still several options available to us in our planning. And there's an option for us to push back the timelines and still be able to offer box competition this year. Collaboration across all the home nation unions is key, obviously, because at the very top tier of our competition uh, in the men's and women's game it is cross border. So we have to make sure that, um, you know, we, we are liaising and we're all clear on what the return to play phase is for in for each nation and there are options to us in terms of being able to facilitate cross-border competition in terms of finding the lowest common denom denominator in terms of restrictions so for example if um, scrums aren't allowed in England but they are in Wales and Scotland there are a number of options where we can look at creating our regulations to facilitate an adapted competition that still allows all home nations to play within that. And that's why the conversations that are ongoing at the moment between the RFU, the WRU and the SRU are incredibly important. Um, we do understand though that universities may need to make tough decisions. You know, there may, uh, the national or local guidelines may allow travel and may allow technically competition to take place, but institutions may take their own decisions around restricting travel for example even if the guidelines permitted it so we understand that universities are working through a level of complexity at the moment and that actually you know there may be better suited offers for them this season and that might include localized competition that's not bucks or intramural offers may be the best choice and it's probably the, the key message here is that we understand that and we support that at the end of the day, students actually taking part in activity and competition is our priority. Obviously, we'd love for everyone to stay within our competition structure, but that the priority students taking part in activity are over that. Um, and it's an extraordinary season. You know, we are trying our best to facilitate activity in the current landscape. Um, and we, you know, there are going to be challenges still ahead, still decisions to make, but we are positive for the future. We do see a return to competition in 21, 22. So, you know, we want to make sure that Box is still here and functioning uh, and available when we can get back to, to that place in the hopefully not too distant future. So that's all the kind of um, key messages from me. And as I said, happy to answer some questions in the Q&A on any of that later on. I think I'm now handing over to Mark for um, his update. Thanks very much, Jenny. That really helpful information there. And uh, and just to reiterate to everyone that we've been working really closely with Bucks um, and regular conversations with the other home unions on, on our return to play work. Um, so I don't need to be as, as, uh, as detailed as Jenny because she's covered a lot of it. However, I have got a couple of quick slides, so I'll just share my screen as well. If I can find the right button to do it with. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, if you can't, someone please shout. Uh, so, so very brief, I'm just going to talk about our, the current position um, and some of the thing, the work ons that, that Jenny has talked about as well. So first of all, you'll all, all be aware that we um, lockdown has brought a, a stop to the community game, which includes our university club game as well. And we're back to stage A. Uh, our school and schools and colleges actually can continue. Some of you might be aware under the government uh, Department for Education guidance, but um, everywhere else, including universities, we're, we're back to stage A for the duration of lockdown. Uh, we've updated the kit bag in, to reflect that. And probably, whereas we would always point to the first column uh, when rugby activity is taking place, much more relevant now are some of the other columns and were reflected in some of your answers in the polls for KT as well. For example, workforce training is a, is a big area for everyone at the moment. So, so please do look at that updated version. You've got the address down there at the bottom, englandrugby.com slash education for the updated version and also uh, information that can help with keeping people engaged with the game, even if they're not playing it. So, so please do have a look at the updated kit bag as well. We are working on return to play. Uh, with, uh, with government and also now with World Rugby and through our governance and law systems. Uh, as you know, it's been uh, trailed well in the media. We're looking at the development of an adapted contact format of the game so that we can get back to some form of contact. 
uh, which reduces the high risk areas such as the mall and scrum. Uh, using what we're learning from the Premier 15s at the moment, uh, but of course there are still scrums and malls involved in that game, so we're having to look at whether uh, those can still be included in adapted format. Uh, a lot of work needs to take place on that because it will be regulation and law change. We also, as well as having to go through government, we need to go through World Rugby as well. So, so there's a, a, a lot of work going on at the moment to try and one, get to a format and two, get it through the right governance structures as well. Our, our aim is to move quickly enough to be able, once lockdown finishes, to be able to indicate when that we're, that adapted contact format will come in. Uh, now that again is a little bit how long's a piece of string, and you know from these updates before that that we we become very optimistic at times. Then we get barriers put in the way and things, uh, understandably, uh, through our discussions with government and public health England. So although that's our aim, we can't guarantee it. But as close to the end of lockdown, we want to be able to to say what a return to contact rugby would look like. Um, and we continue, as Jenny says, our discussions across borders uh, with the other home unions, but there are still the challenges that, that we all know exist because of uh, different government uh, restrictions and guidance that's in place across the board. What we also want to make sure we do in a return to contact rugby is ensure that there is a, a period and guidance around pip preparing to play contact which is really important. Player welfare and safety and safeguarding is absolutely central to anything that we do in the game. So, so we're looking at how we can make sure we include that within the returning to a contact format of the game as well. Jenny mentioned the adult competition programming clubs. Uh, so if we talk about our work ons at the moment, uh, the release of all of that information and, and clusters of clubs playing locally against each other in friendly self-organised league formats coincided with a, a number of the changes now that are taking place that you're experiencing in the university sector around uh, migration home at Christmas, uh, testing protocols, return to more online learning etc. So because those things coincided we weren't able to look at the university liaison with those club uh, leagues etc th at that point in time. We're now onto that, it's a work on for us and and looking at can we is there a way we can align university rugby with those those local club clusters as well uh, in a local area so so that's a, a watch out for us and we'll make sure we keep uh, you informed on that and we're also looking at what the implications of those various changes in the sector are um, and, and what that might mean for retention of players uh, who, who most of their rugby is in universities how can we try as a game to ensure we retain them as well We'll continue to align with Bucks uh, and, and the announcements that, that Jenny talked about tomorrow and next week, et cetera, around league restarts uh, are part of our, our discussion and thoughts around the return to rugby as well. Um, and then finally, just, uh, I don't want to state the obvious, but right across the game and, and across other sports as well, there, as we all recognise, there's a huge risk to retention of players uh, because of what we're going through this season. Um, and, and we see that risk, certainly for our university-based players, we could have a prolonged period or a more prolonged period of them not playing uh, with some of the things that are happening in the sector. So, so we've got a real uh, eye on that now and want to do some, some work and dial up our work with clubs around what's their welcome and readiness for university students who are, uh, who are now going to be at home potentially rather than at, at university. What's their offer for students who are away at university as well and how can the game actually work together um, and not only from the club side but what could you do as universities to signpost the club network and as Jenny said we are all in this together and our interest is in making sure that every rugby player who wants to play rugby this season gets to play uh, in whatever environment we can make that available for them and that's probably some of what the guys will talk about in a second as well so that's a real work on for us as well. Uh, so that's it from me, a uh, bit, bit of a short update hopefully than usual, but a number of things we're working towards and uh, I'm now going to hand over to JP uh, for the next section. Thanks Mark, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, this segment of the webinar is going to look at models of good practice to help you keep your players interested and engaged in term two. Uh, I'm really lucky to have 
uh, Joe, Cameron, Nathaniel and Richard here to share some of their experiences uh, and ideas that they've done to keep their players engaged. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and then hand over to Joe. Morning, everyone. Um, I, hope, I hope everyone's uh, everyone's doing fine. Um, my name is Joe Wimpenny. I'm the head of rugby at Oxford Brooks um, Rugby Football Club. And um, some of the stuff that we've been doing is um, around uh, our intramural offer. Uh, so during the uh, during the the close season, obviously when we when there is the announcement that um, that Bucks might not be starting until January. We thought, right, what are we, what, what do we need to do to ensure that that we're keeping everybody engaged um, uh, and active within the rugby club? Um, so we came up with an intramural offer, which was something that we were going to probably look at doing anyway. Um, and we looked around, looked at the uh, the grant, the grants that were available from the SRFU and applied for for one of those grants to support this. So. Um, and, and we, thankfully, we were successful in, in that application process and, and that money's been put to good use. So what, what we sort of decided on was um, we usually get around about 200 people, 200 freshers sign up at, at Freshers Fairs. So we wanted to keep those guys engaged for, for as long as possible. So we created 12 teams, um, all with, with animal names, as you can see there by the slides, so bears, stags, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and create and, and created a fixture, a weekly a weekly competitive playing off of um, playing off of for for those teams, um, just to give everybody some normality um, with regards to what their week, weekly structure is like. So on a Wednesday afternoon, we play those games in replace of in the place of where the Bucks fixtures would have been, so that lads uh, so that the guys are still preparing for a Wednesday afternoon competitive playing offer. Um, what we also did was our senior players, uh, so our senior second years and our senior and our third years and for some of our fourth years, we gave those guys opportunity to, to be leaders of those teams. So they were captains um, and they, they, they then had to they, they then had to shoulder responsibility of organizing kit, of selecting teams of, um, uh, of, of actually drafting the team. So one thing that we, we did was we created an NFL, NFL style draft with all the members of the club uh, in, in around about in 13 rounds of 13, 14, 15 rounds of picks, um, which was quite a fun evening actually. So all of, the, uh, all of the senior players and all of the captains and the leaders were in the room at the same time, obviously on, on tables of six, so they were socially distanced. And, um, and we had the draft there and it was interesting to see, you know, if you were draft pick number one, how and you picked and you picked someone that was uh, that you wanted in your team. Uh, you could see the other guys reacting and sort of getting a bit upset because they wanted them in their team and going back to the, 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 the drawing board with regards to that. Um, so it's given the it's given the players and the the lead the the, the, the captains of the team some opportunities to to lead um, from a coaching uh, coaching playing uh, organizational point of view. What we also did was we created some uh, we created some animal themed superpowers uh, for for each of those teams. So an example of of that would be um, so. Uh, let's say that the, uh, the 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 stags, for example, they're really good at jumping, so they get an opportunity within a ten minute, uh, within a fifteen minute game, to use a two minute power play uh, where any of their uh, attacking kicks can't be contested by the opposition. So kicks within the air. So stags are, yeah, like I say, stags are re renowned at jumping quite high. So any kicks in the air are, are not allowed, are not able to be contested by the opposition. So uh, it was interesting to see how the players then started to think tactically around how they use use those superpowers. Um, moving on to that, so we we created 12, 12, obviously the 12 teams with one league. Uh, the top four will go through to, uh, to, to play into a playoff. Uh, sorry, into the championship playoff. Middle four will go into a plate playoff and then the bottom four eventually will go into the bowl playoff. So even if your team's not doing so great, there's still something to play for and still something to, to, to win at the end of that. Uh, in terms of uh, engagement, so we've, and how that, obviously we've got all of, all of the players within the club, so around 200 of them all sort of 
associated with one of those teams um and we and we've probably had we've had 100 down at each at each night so we've had six six teams playing each other on one one evening then the next evening the next afternoon we've had the other six teams playing each other so yeah that's some of the stuff that we've done and the uh, the SRF SRFU grant has really helped us to to support that in terms of booking additional pitches uh pitch time uh getting kit sorted for the lads um and all that type of stuff so yeah that's our uh, that's what we've been up to uh and i'm gonna hand over to to cameron now who uh who'll be able to tell you about his his offer thanks everyone good morning everyone uh i'm cameron uh i'm the rugby development coordinator for the sheffield cluster uh, so that includes Sheffield Hallam University and University of Sheffield. Uh, and as Mark touched upon today, um, the key emphasis that we're looking to, to work on within our cluster is retention of students. Um, we're really quite lucky in the Sheffield cluster that we've got four brilliant uh, booked university clubs. And before lockdown 2.0, uh, which we're all involved in at the moment, um, we were able to work with the clubs um, to engage in ready for rugby uh, and also took rugby. And we were able to implement uh, intra-club touch rugby competitions as well as ready for rugby events. And the key emphasis in the, the key takeout of this activity um, was the feedback that we got and that there is a clear desire, um, a clear desire and want the competition within our university rugby clubs. So that then led to the blueprint that we've pulled together at the moment uh, and we're looking to, to work upon and that is for semester two to have a ready for rugby series between our cluster so that would allow our men's and women's rugby clubs uh, to take part in weekly pitches between team hallam and sport sheffield now jenny spoke about books uh, which would be fantastic if books can happen uh, but our ready for rugby series will be able to provide a contingency plan if books can't happen to have a local competition, uh, both men's and women's uh, across our cluster. And if books does happen, then actually our ready for rugby series and our blueprint that we've got um, will enable our development players to be able to stay engaged in the game and be able to retain that, um, their numbers and be able to grow our clubs. Uh, finally, the last thing for me is really um, there's lots of different universities on this call and um, lots of different numbers and sizes of clubs. And this series could easily be adapted across different university partners, different clusters, um, different sizes of clubs. It could even be community rugby clubs. Um, but yeah, it could be completely adapted dependent on the roadmap also. So that's quite brief from me. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Richard. Thanks. Hi, I'm Richard and I'm from Exeter University. Um, our offer is very, very similar to Joe's really, as in we looked at um, the rules around Ready for Rugby and how they could be adapted to provide um, an offer for all of our players. Now, as people are aware, Exeter is a fairly, fairly large university, so our playing numbers are, you know, are high. So we sort of took the same approach as Joe really um, and tried to provide an offering for all all of the club so from our elite players to our development players so we've actually structured it as in a premiership a championship and that one um which hopefully provides an equal opportunity from a competitive playing nature um for these players now we did do a draft based system um so each league has a number of teams um based on the playing pool um and we've got captains within them who were part of the draft and and players got drafted however we are working on a fantasy um league structure so each captain has has a value um and players values go up and down based on their own performances so every game or every set of series we have um if they have good passes make line breaks score tries get assists their value can then increase if they make errors make defensive reads or poor defensive reads drop the ball, get Simbin for, for whatever reason, their value can go down. And each week the captains have to work 
um, within a draft scenario based on hitting hitting a criteria of whatever that value is. Um, we've added some like little bits to say actually there is if if a player was self isolating and he was in your team you would get an additional budget to to cater for that player who who was out with COVID. But um, that's really what we've looked at and you know we've looked at what they've done in with the Bermuda tens and how that could be implemented unfortunately we didn't get to implement that but we looked at like conversion jeopardy and how that could be in, implemented into the game so not only scoring tries is worth points but actually if we can put our kickers under stress um, and put them in realistic or or environments where there is actually pressure to get to get points um and you know the main purpose of our, our game was to just to cater for what what we're looking for um and the biggest thing i can say is you know you, the game is that we the game's been designed but it, you've got to find something suitable for you um we looked at a team format so we tried to make sure that there was key positions in each area so we they had to have five forwards and five backs um we they had to have a range of positions so you know, we we specified you needed one prop, one hooker, um, three three back rows slash second rows, a scrum half, a fly half, and a back three. Um, and we played it in a tens format. Um, so that was that was there. So actually, a team couldn't get one or a high number of backs or forwards in in one team to to play. So that was really what our offer was. Um, it played it was played in a similar. A vein to Joe, you had an attacking zone where you had five uh, five uh, touches to score, and then if you scored, obviously, then um, the the game would be reset. If we didn't go into lockdown, we would have looked at how we could implement lineouts and scrums if they were back in the game. And we've also thought about the approach of actually, if we do go into a contact environment, could we add a contact environment in in this in this area? Um, so that's the offer from Exeter, and I'll pass over to Nathaniel. Um, hi everyone, I'm Nathaniel from De Montfort University Men's and Women's Rugby. I'm the club secretary for the men's team. Um, and I'll be giving you going through our offer with you um, and what we're doing more off the pitch as we don't have a scale, um, a scale of the club as similar to like the likes of Exeter or Oxford Brooks. Um, so we've looked at what we can do off the pitch as a team to kind of keep engagement and keep club focus going. Um, so we've had a massive focus on charity with charities like Movember, Breast Cancer UK. Um, LGBT organisations and NHS charities for COVID relief, uh, things that we can all get behind as a team and really focus on have competitions within the team if we can raise the most money and this keeps kind of engagement with everyone going. Um, we've looked at on online, engage on, um, um, online engagement um, of university initiatives. Uh, so we have online socials to keep everyone in good team spirits, keep the socials going, keep everyone to get to know each other in the men's and women's team. So the freshers can get to know one another, can get to get, get to know everyone on the team. And when we do get back to playing, everyone is kind of acclimatised together as a whole team. Um, and we've also looked at meeting with professional coaches and professional players to kind of keep our rugby brains going, um, to keep that engagement going, to get players excited to kind of be able to strategize and things that we can do on the pitch, like line outs and strike moves, for example. Um, we have online fitness plans provided to us by our SNC coaches um, so that we can do kind of Zoom calls and train together, um, obviously apart due to the circumstances, but train together through a video call. So we can still keep that kind of team sentiment, team element going. Um, and we have challenges and tasks for players to complete throughout lockdown to keep some form of competition to go throughout the team, such as scavenger hunts. Uh, so who can complete a certain amount of uh, cha uh, challenges or activities, wins a prize. And this, again, keeps kind of competition going throughout the team um, off the pitch, which is kind of important nowadays. Um, but then again, we need one of our large initiatives this year and something for the whole club to kind of rally behind um, and really kind of keep this engagement going because we have a goal for the end of it. Um, is the is looking at the inclusion and diversity within uh, university sport. This is within our own university, but we also want to expand it to other universities. Um, so we want to create a clear framework of reporting acts of discrimination with our yeah, own university and create training programs for committee members and coaches um, and club members of how to handle these situations. It does happen in university sport, unfortunately, about acts of racism or discrimination on the pitch. And often players or committee members or even coaches don't know how to handle these, don't know how to resolve these and kind of give closure to players that have experienced this. Um, so we, we're looking at ways uh, within our own university how we can create framework where this can be reported, this can be affected, not necessarily within our own society, but from other universities um, as well, affecting other, other players and things like that. 
Um, we're also looking at creating uh, a simpler process for reporting apps in uh, like a larger organizations such as Books RFU. Again, it's similar to the local university one, but expanding it to larger organizations so it can come from the top down to other universities. Um, as well, offer training to referees um, to help them understand how to handle these situations on the pitch, um, as this can be quite important to, um, this can be quite a kind of important first response and how it can be resolved for, again from the top down, so the referee is the first point of call. Um, and ideally, we do want to expand these, these this kind of reform to other universities and other rugby programs across the country, um, or adapt them from what is already in place in those universities, as it can have a real big. This can have a kind of a real effect and change the kind of nature of the sport, and then obviously the negative connotations that can come with um, discrimination on the pitch. Uh, this kind of this goal that we have uh, really keep, keeps engagement going as a club. Everyone uh, keeps on everyone keeps on driving towards one uh, goal, and everyone keeps on yeah working together. So that, that's the pitch from us and what we're doing off the pitch from a smaller scale rugby club. So yeah, thank you. Um, I'll hand you back to JP now, uh, I think. So thank you for listening, guys. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, I'd just like to give a, a, a big thank you to uh, Joe, Nathaniel, Cameron and Richard for sharing their experiences. I think that's really helpful. Uh, hopefully uh, you'll all be able to take something back with that. And we will, we will share those slides with you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. So I'll start with you, Nathaniel, just because we've come off yours. Um, how proactive were the teams in getting involved in this initiative and supporting that and driving that forward? Are you just on mute, Nathaniel? There we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, so obviously everyone's involved in it together. It's everyone's idea that has come together to kind of create what we want to create and kind of put the proposal we want to push um, push in. Um, but yeah, obviously because of the, what, the, the kind of protests and things that have happened over the summer, it's something that is on everyone's mind, it's something that everyone wants to achieve and push towards. So yeah, everyone's had input on it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's really important. And uh, I wish you the best luck with that. Um, Richard, one for you. Um, what impact uh, did your initiative have on player morale? So around that self-valuation and was it a good CPD tool? Um, yeah, I think it's had a really positive impact. I think the players were actually really excited to play. And once they come back um, from obviously lockdown one, they've come back to university and, you know, they're, they're athletes and they want to go out and compete at the highest level. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that. Um, so this initiative really allows them to have something on their some ownership on themselves. And I think like having a value to which it goes up and down based on their own performance provides that. So a team can't win our, our game. Um, a player's value can only go up. Yes, captains can compete against each other um, who, on who can pick the best team and who can get the players, the best players drafted and stay within their budget. But the ultimate goal is for players to value to go up, up. Um, week on week and then that shows there so I think it's a, it's been really really good and players are using the videos of the games and working out how how their values calculated and, and things like that so I think it's been really good from a CPD point of view um, I think players are reflecting they you know they're going back through through what they've done they're, they're looking at their decision making and it all goes inside with the core values of the game really um, and from a social aspect as well like players aren't socialising in, in ways that they've socialised before at university. So actually bringing large groups of, together, even in different teams, is allowing yeah. social players to be sociable with each other where they wouldn't be able to um, in this current environment. Great. Thanks. And that's really important. Um, we're just running short on time. So if anybody does have any more questions, please put them in the Q&A and chat and then we'll, we'll be able to share that at the end. Um, listen, guys, thank you very much for that. And I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Chaston for the Q&A panel. So if we can all just turn our cameras off and uh, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, JP. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew Chaston, University Partnerships Manager. I'm just going to bring back uh, Jenny, Mark and Katie. There's a few questions that came in beforehand, uh, which I'm just going to put to the group. If there are any more, uh, we, we've got a little bit of time left. There's a, if there's any more, please use the Q&A and I'll try my best to direct those to the group uh, as they turn the cameras on. Jenny and Mark, if you could join us. Thank you very much. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll get straight into it. First one, um, unfortunately, uh, due to university restrictions, only been able to play a few training sessions before lockdown. Um, and so haven't been able to teach girls the contact side of the sport. So um, depending on future restrictions, if all goes to plan, after two weeks of training in January, we could be expecting some girls to go straight back to contact games. 
Uh, due to that time limit, worry about safety of players. Um, we may have to exclude people and we may not be able to get a team together. So I suppose one for Jenny, Jenny and Mark, maybe. Uh, is there any way that if necessary, a touch or a ready for rugby game could be played instead of full contact or maybe using the game on principle? So if I go, say, Jenny, if I go to you first. Yeah, so I think, um, it, first of all, it links back to the scenarios I touched on earlier in terms of depending when the league start date is. So at the moment, there are break weeks built into um, that planning. So what we could do and something that we're looking at is pushing the league start dates back, particularly for contact sports, uh, to allow for that training and kind of coaching and upskilling to, to take place. So that's one option available to us. Um, we can also look at the regulations uh, around the competitions and at, at different tiers themselves. Um, we do um, have at, at tiers within the women's game already different kind of front row and scrimmage rules um, that actually reflect on the 19s contact at certain tiers. So um, there's lots of options available to us. I think the best thing that people can do is feed into um, the consultation that we'll undertake around competitions group to let us know what the kind of best possible environment is for players, to be honest, Andrew. So I think being aware of things like that is incredibly useful and we can factor that into our planning. That's great. Anything to add, Mark? Uh, no, the, the only two things I just referenced back what I said earlier on, Andrew, I think it's a really important question. And for me, two things stand true. One, player welfare is paramount. If players aren't ready to play contact rugby, no one should be making them do so or asking them to do so. So I think it's a really strong point in terms of that. And then, and then the second one is we have to think differently and more flexibly. And that's exactly what Jenny's talked about. So, so yeah, that, that's all I'd add on, on in terms of those. Except Great. that I'm, I'm really pleased to see you wearing your new uh, Umbro stash as well, Andrew. Yeah. We're on brand yeah. today, aren't we? It's all right. We are on brand. Doing well. Um, okay, next question. Maybe to, to you, Mark, first. And there's there's a similar one just coming from Tom on the chat. So Tom's asked about, do we know what stage the RFU will come out uh, with on 3rd of December? Uh, will we know the stage before this lockdown ends? Do we know if it will automatically go back to stage D? Um, and there's a similar question uh, that came in beforehand as well is around the, any new format of the game so that leagues can be played. Uh, could you maybe just, exp um, you probably mentioned it earlier, but maybe just expand on that a little bit for us. Yeah, yeah. In terms of Tom's question, it's, it's the million dollar question, isn't it, really, at the moment? And that's the piece we're working on. Is what does the game look like when we're able to restart? Um, so that's our work we're doing with government at the moment. We want to be able to let people know before we get to that point, of course, what, what the game will look like when it comes out. It would be great if we were able to go back to something um, uh, related to contact, the contact game. Um, however, go back to the previous question, we want to make sure players are ready. So a, a period of, of stage D before you go to stage E or F my, is my personal view. That would be really helpful in terms of preparing players properly. Um, we don't know yet, but, but that's what we're pushing for is to ensure we're able to let people know before that point in time on the 3rd of December. So there's real clarity of, of what the game looks like on the pitch when we restart. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so another one here, and maybe it's, maybe it's one for Mark, Katie. Um, so what support or guidance will be provided to ensure that teams can continue to attract and retain players if rugby continues without competition when other sports such as football and rugby league uh, move forward? Oh, do you want me to? I'll, I'll start on, on that one. Um, so in, in terms of what, what support we can offer, obviously events like today, um, and trying to share good practice across the sector so everybody can learn from each other, maybe take some, take some ideas back to your own institutions. As we said right at the start, everybody's got very different circumstances. So it's about kind of taking ideas and then thinking how you can apply it in your own context. Um, more widely than that, obviously, we as an organisation are looking at um, what other support we can offer. So again, as I said at the start, some of the off the pitch engagement and um, slightly biased, but as Nathaniel was saying at De Montford, what, what we're trying to do in terms of um, still creating that community feel. So there's something that students want to be part of, even if you're not necessarily out on the pitch. So um, watch this space for what comes out from, from us jointly with the RFU around more CPD opportunities and um, that, that off the pitch development and engagement that you can maybe be looking at working on more in term two, if 
fingers crossed it, it we do get some rugby plays but just in case we don't there'll be lots of other things we can get involved in Anything to add on that, Mark? Yeah, I'd I just add, I think everyone recognises that, that rugby union is one of the sports that has more challenges because of the nature of how the game's played, the contact game's played. Um, where our indications are that we will be more strongly aligned with some of those other sports than we were beforehand. Um, as I think we outlined on the last the September version of this, we were pushing for a full contact return. Um, and at that point, we were getting some really strong indications that's where we would go. We now know that's not going to be the case. Um, and we've been opening the media about that. We're looking at an adapted version, which probably means we'll be more in step with some of the other sports than, than perhaps we were beforehand. Um, but I'd also just emphasise what we've just done for, for 10, 15 minutes with JP and the guys. You sharing how you do that sort of stuff is massively important. And Kate, as Katie said, we're trying to create forums and opportunities for you to be able to do that. There's nothing better than the sector, you know, self self solutionizing, if you like, to say, here's a way you can do something. Um, and we will continue to try and push that. And there's nothing we'd like more than to, to share examples on our social channels as well. I, I'd like to add in there. So if there's anything, send it our way because we, we need to help each other out here. Um, uh, and a question. So Matt, Matt in the chat, but also one that came in about how do we get coaching and ref courses? But Matt has also said, um basically the same thing and is there funding available um mark i know there's there's a link in a kit bag to an updated guide on the on the training courses maybe uh, is that something you wanted to expand on or is it simply that's point people towards the kit bag yeah i'd, I'd point towards the kit bag and, and have a look at that that short on-demand webinar in there uh, matt you asked specifically around the furlough situation we are back um, a number of staff are back on furlough from, a, from an RFU point of view, and that does include our new coach developers out in the field. Um, so, but they, we will be able to sort of talk about when everyone returns uh, once lockdown finishes, and those guys will be back in, and that they will be the contact point uh, as you've you've sort of indicated in your question, Matt, to, to go to. Uh, but have a look at the on-demand webinar, and and that will reference some of those things in there. And Andrew, just, can I add in as well? Sorry. Yes, just, please uh, go for it. Yeah. In terms of the the second round of grant funding from the SRFU, it is more than likely that we will have a portion of that ring fence for coaching and, and referee development. So um, again, slightly up in the air at the moment whilst we work out what is going to be possible um, in, in term two for the criteria and how we manage that. But that was um, definitely in our thinking. Um, and now the updates come out from the RFU, we're, we're a little bit further forward in how we might do that. So again, keep your eyes peeled on info coming out from us about how to, how to apply. Just to stress everyone, on the, on the kit bag, the Getting Training Started webinar, there's a link in, in there. It's a, just a 10 minute webinar. It just takes you through the whole journey for this year and how, how it looks. So that is the main thing that you should uh, watch to start with, just a 10 minute on-demand webinar. That's great, thank you. Um, Rob, you asked a question in the chat as well. Um, could we get access to coach education resources to deliver in-house training to student volunteers and players who aren't experiencing contact? Uh, one thing to note, again, there's the Keep Your Boots On library, which has loads of online CPD and courses that anybody can access for free. So some really useful stuff in there that I would, I would point you towards. So that's your Keep Your Boots On uh, library. So have a look at that. Uh, Michael, in the chat, the, the webinar, uh, if you look further up the chat, I've put the link to the kit bag further up the chat. So all the links you need, we put everything in one place in a kit bag. So have a look at that. And there's all sorts of links in there, including the training uh, webinar uh, thing we just talked about. Um, one more in the chat here. So is, is there an update to higher education exemption from Bucks, Sport England and DCMS to support universities that don't have their own facility to play rugby and re require to go externally? Maybe Jenny, if I... Uh, go to you to pick that one up in the first place. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Unfortunately, there isn't. Um, we're not clear on what um, the guidelines or the landscape is going to look like uh, once we come out of uh, lockdown, really in relation to term two planning. There is some updated guidance around um, <clears throat> what universities are being asked to do once this lockdown ends um, towards the end of term in terms of um, getting students back home for Christmas. But in terms of what the landscape is going to look like in January, and what the guidelines and guidance is going to be around whether that's university owned facilities or external facilities or travel or anything like that. Unfortunately, there's no clarity on at the moment. So we're still waiting on updated guidance and information. Thanks for that, Jenny. 
there's one more question that uh, came in beforehand. Um, so maybe Katie will come to you first. With lots of coverage about uh, Black Lives Matter and trans players, what are you doing to be more inclusive? Yeah, uh, great question, big question. Um, but obviously the RFU are specifically looking at inclusion and that's a huge piece of work. Um, for us as SRFU, I think it comes back to what I said at the start around um, member representation and member engagement. So uh, the working groups are kind of asked around interest. That's, that's one idea we've got about how we might bring students in um, and, and again, learn from the sector because we know that higher education is really at the forefront in a lot of ways with inclusion and diversity. So it's what we can learn from what's happening out in your, your clubs, your universities and bring that into the game and into the sport and hopefully influence more widely than just the university sector. Um, but great question, big, big issue, big topic. Um, and a lot of the stuff that Nathaniel talked about and how we can weave that in more widely to our work. Um, yeah, lot, lots to do. And Katie, I think now there's no other questions. So just over to you for closing remarks. Brilliant, thank you, Andrew and uh, Mark and Jenny. Thanks for those last Q and A um, answers. So. Yeah, just comes down to me to thank you all for joining us today. We really hope that you found it useful um, and that you've taken information and ideas a way that you can go and actually use in your institution. So um, again, thank you for giving us the time. We are all in this together to use that terrible cliche, um, but let's keep working towards getting as many people um, back to the game when they can play um, and get their boots back on. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day and uh, take a look at the kit bag and get your resources there. Thanks very much, everybody.